so I, I guess I, I, I'd like to start with some kind of um, overview of the evolution of peer production. Uh, so the evolution of open collaborative systems where peers can congregate and work on on common projects um, and so come to the idea that we are entering a new phase uh, which we call cosmolocal production so I'll I'll, I'll, I'll get to to that by um, by explaining a bit about the, the history of the commons and then specifically peer production so first a very broad um, overview so uh, so to be sure that we talk the same language so the commons is any shared resource that is maintained uh, by uh, a community or a group of stakeholders following its own rules and and, and regulations so it has an objective uh, definition which is a resource it has a subjective definition in, in the sense that it's maintained by people so it's a choice that people make to to organize something as a commons and the third one is important because it's an institution it's different from the state and from the from the pure market forms um, and so in human history the commons is the first way of exchanging so if you look at early tribal groups you know family bands that's what they do they 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 do it for the group um, and then comes the next uh, means of exchange uh, when tribes become more complex which is the gift economy so what's the difference in a commons you give to the whole in a gift economy economy you give to a person or a group with the expectation that there is a return uh, then comes redistribution the evolution of the state um, and hierarchical systems and then finally we get into market pricing which is a dominant form today um, so the commons is first something we do with natural resources it's how we organize fishing uh, forests mountain uh, slopes um, and when capitalism emerges in the 17th 18th century let's say um, they privatize those social those those natural resource commons so we start believing as humanity that it's better to privatize that it's more efficient if we have private property and so we do what's called the enclosures which is the you know the fencing basically of the commons into private property so in early capitalism 19th century all these farmers come to the cities they die very young about 32 years uh, life expectancy and and you know all the uh, issues of that early system and then we get a second phase of commoning which is really social so all the fraternities the it's basically about mutualizing risk right so it's it's what the labor movement does in the 19th century and it's the form of commons because it's pooling resources to manage life risk and that becomes a welfare system so the natural resource commons are privatized and the social commons are state statified if you like right in the welfare state model um, and then we get a third phase which is what is interesting for us is that once we have digital networks we have a rebirth of the commons to open source collaboration people are sharing code creating commons of code uh, inventing new types of licenses so now we are in the period i want to discuss here so the first phase is this enormous um growth of open source communities sharing knowledge sharing designs and sharing software um i think in 2008 we get the second step of that modern re-emergence of the commons which is the what i call the urban commons and, and some of you may know i did a study in the city of ghent so where we mapped the urban commons so these are shared mobility shared housing you know shared energy these kind of things and i guess here what i want to stress is that so basically urban people start reorganizing provisioning systems because they don't like what the market and the state has to offer so we get for example collective purchasing groups for organic food we get uh, village co-ops in germany for renewable energy um, so we get all so and we have a tenfold increase of these 
uh, urban commons from 2008 to 2017. So that has been confirmed in, in different places in the world. So this is going on right now. Uh, but I would stress that most of these urban commons are redistributive. So what, what I want to say with that is that they, um, they don't generally make stuff, right? So you have people who do software, they make software and they put it in, in a commons like Linux. But people who do shared mobility or shared housing, they generally do not make the cars and do not make the housing. And the reason for this is capital, is the access to capital, right? So if you don't have access to capital, which in the material world is a, is a very strong demand, very strong condition for success, um, then basically you do pooling in the, in, the, in the consumption field, in the usage field, right? But two exceptions, which is energy and food. So we now have ecosystems. So even let, let me give you an example, and I hope you can still follow what I'm trying to explain here. So you have an exchange between consumers and farmers. You could say that's the market, and it is. It is a market exchange. But the ecosystem is an agreement between consumers and producers, right? There is a risk sharing. So it's not a pure market. There's a risk sharing where the consumers are going to pool their buying power um, and buy a percentage of the producer so they have a guaranteed income. So you can see this is no longer like a purely capitalist marketplace. It's a marketplace that is kind of embedded in social rules and, and the ecosystem is jointly ruled by these consumers and producing groups. So that's a multi-stakeholder uh, governance. And okay, so, so we have open source, then we have urban commons that redistribute, and then we have the start in food and energy of urban commons that produce. And I want to give you one more example of this is um, what's called the multi-factory model. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is very interesting to me because this is also real production. So this, we have 120 of them just in the EU. So these are basically, cra basically craftspeople uh, that neutralize their working environment. So they look for old factories, um, you know, like docks and stuff. And you have people working with steel, you have people working with plastics, with textiles, 3D printing, and they basically get together to organize their economic life. So it's really about producing and making a living, but they organize themselves collectively and they use open source, um, practices. Uh, so this is very interesting because this is a, a fairly low capital requirement for small businesses. But it, it does show you kind of a growth from, you know, the pure immaterial software to already these models emerging in at least, you know, low capital requirement uh, production. Okay, so now I want to integrate the blockchain in that, right? So I would say we have a first phase of the internet where we have an internet of communication. And this allows for massive mutual coordination, which we call stigmergy, so that people who are in these open knowledge and open software communities are going to organize their work because they can see each other. They can see whoever is doing what in an open transparent system. And so they are going to work outside of both pure market pricing and hierarchical commands. They need to say, oh, I can do this because I'm part of an ecosystem. I can see what the rest of them is doing. Um, so what the blockchain offers, what distributed ledgers in general offer in this kind of evolution is that we move from an internet of communication to an internet of transaction. And why is this interesting? Because um, once you have a vision of transactions, you you are in physical production, right? So what? So accounting and logistics is basically how we see the world, the physical world, and how we can account for our actions in the physical world. So this is the big change that the blockchain brings in the field of possibility: is that this mutual coordination that we already have in free software can now actually move to 
production. So I want to briefly stress why accounting is so important because it's how we see the world. So the first accounting is the first leg the first um, legend we find is actually the origin of writing. It's in Sumeria. And we see uh, these cuneiform tablets that indicate uh, in a temple the things coming in, grain, and things going out. And so that's basically co in co-evolution with the state, right? So as soon as you have these temples, which are outside of direct relations of production between uh, buyers and sellers, um, the uh, this is like a uh, emerging state form, right? It's, it stands outside of society. It organizes society. So that's the invention of accounting. The second step is in the 15th century, more or less, with, um, I forgot his name now, Pacho Lucha or something like that. So the Franciscan monk who synthesizes uh, double entry book accounting. And, uh, and it's very easy to say this is the co-emerging with capitalism, right? It's, it's the market forces in these free medieval cities, Florence, uh, Venice, etc. Uh, they need this to do their business, their commerce. And so double entry book accounting is like, makes that possible. Um, so the limit of double entry book accounting is that it only sees what comes in a collective entity and what comes out of that collective entity. So it has no vision no knowledge, no consciousness of externalities. Everything that happens in the ecosystem is invisible to the consciousness of the people who work with uh, double entry book accounting. And so this is why it's very important that we have now the invention of new forms of accounting, which allow us to do this. And I'll mention the three of them. Uh, the first one is contributive accounting. And this is very important in the open source communities and peer production communities. So the basic idea is a lot of people collectively create common value, but only some of them will uh, get an access to the market so that they can realize that value. And this creates an issue of equity in any which, which is largely based on contributions is that some people will be able to, to capture the value and others will not. And of course, in the systems that we know, like, uh, let's say, Facebook and Google, this is almost 100%. All the people that collectively create the value don't have access to the commercialization of that value. Um, so contribute, contributive accounting, the idea is that you create a, you create a membrane between the market and the non-market and that uh, you could say, and I, I'm using words from Jeff Ebbett of Commons, you can have the coal currency outside, which is an extractive currency. It rewards extractive activity. But inside you can have a warm currency that rewards generative uh, currency uh, activity, right? So this is contributive accounting. Uh, the second uh, element is flow accounting. And this is resources, events, agents, REA accounting that has been existing for about 20 years, but is now getting a new lease of life because of the blockchain uh, capacities. And here the idea is to, to use the accounting to show flow. So there's no double entry, but it's, and that's very significant because double entry is typically uh, well, what is uh, capitalist accounting means. Here we have a system that actually tells you that every transaction is a 3D related action in an ecosystem. So suddenly the East becomes visible and the flow in the ecosystem becomes visible. So you have suddenly you have a consciousness of the whole that is there through the accounting, which wasn't there before. And the third important uh, form of accounting that we have now is thermodynamic accounting. So so I usually mention one one uh, project which I really like, which is called Reporting 3.0, r3o.org. And that talks about the Global Thresholds and Allocations Council. So a group of scientists that keep track of the resource availability. So how much copper there is in the world, what's the biocircular copper, what is expected, new finds 
And so basically, they have a vision of what is called carrying capacity, right? So just to give you a current example with COVID-19, what is the problem? Uh, we didn't have the carrying capacity. So the, the, the flow of things that we needed in medical devices wasn't there to keep up with the flow of the need, right? And this is why we are in a mess, because we didn't take into account uh, the carrying capacity of the medical system. And this is what's happening on a global scale with every resource. The current system is not taking into account because they are externalities with the carrying capacity of the planet in terms of uh, resources. So with thermodynamic accounting, you can actually see the matter and energy flows. Um, and this is called multi-capital accounting. So these people sometimes call themselves multi-capitalists. And so what they, what they want to do is to take into account different forms of capital. And in the current system, we only have an obligation to protect financial capital. If you don't, you can go to jail. All the other forms of capital, we can impoverish without any consequence. In, when you have thermodynamic flow accounting, you can actually start also uh, you know, changing the rules and say, well, you know, as a corporate entity, you have an obligation to also uh, conserve material capital and human capital right okay so um so these these three forms of accounting the promise they hold is that we can actually have a form of accounting that is integral that is holistic that is integrative right and for this we need distributed ledgers shared distributed ledgers and we need shared logistical systems uh and so this is why a blockchain and, and other distributed ledgers are absolutely vital to have the technical infrastructure which allow to do this. So I, I want to um, have this uh, share this idea about you know what does it mean to have an integral integrative development. So let's say you have different systems which combat each other, like you know socialism and capitalism, for example, or the culture wars or whatever you want, right? The idea of an integrative evolution is that you can actually somehow also take the, the relative strength and truth of different competing systems and re reintegrate them at a higher level uh, of complexity. So that's that's the kind of idea. And so what I'm proposing here, and, and this is from a report I wrote uh, last year called P2P Accounting for Planetary Survival, is that we can now take technically it's possible the best of the market, the best of the commons, and the best of the state. So what does that mean? So what, what is typical about the commons is mutual coordination. That, that's the allocation mechanism, mutual coordination through stick merging. So this is why in free software we can work together by seeing what everybody else is doing through accounting shared accounting we can now we can now see the same stigma in material production potentially right so this is taking in what the commons brings to the table in terms of markets we can start thinking more in terms of generative markets markets that work for these new collaborative systems um, and so we can start thinking in terms of generative market uh, solutions uh, for example, fish coin, which is a coin that represents the amount of fish that can be fished without endangering the reproduction of the fish. So unlike a classic sovereign currency, or even these new types of currencies, asset-based or mutual credit currencies, actually tell you something about the outside world. So but if you use these currencies, then you are not blind to the to the material effects of your action in the, in the world. So this is, I think, uh, very important. Um, so this is for generative markets, and I know I could I could go deeper, but this is the basic idea. And the third element is planning. Um, now to uh, to make that clear, let me give you just a, a brief. Uh, historic evolution as seen by an Hungarian author called Peter Pogani. 
So you see society as a complex adapt adaptive system with relatively stable systems that change through chaotic transitions, bifurcations. So in his view, we had a proto-global system, which he calls global system zero, before the French Revolution, the mercantile ancien regime in Europe. This system breaks down through the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. In 30 years, everything changes. And when we are out of that, out of this chaotic transition is the new Smithian, uh, you know, following the rules of Adam Smith, capitalist system, which is really based on domination of capital over labor. Uh, this system is dominant until World War I. So then we have a new chaotic transition, World War I to World War II, and including World War II, that gives the the welfare system and then the neoliberal system that we have today uh, but it's based on a social compact between capital and labor even under the neoliberal period it's still standing actually it hasn't completely disappeared um, and then we have something called what he calls weak multilateralism which is the idea that we now have imf world bank so we have these mitigating mediating institutions on the political political and economic field that can deal with conflicts which wasn't possible before world war ii because we either had no or weak multilateral systems which were not able to mediate conflict but this compact between capital and labor and this weak multilateralism was done at the cost of nature right so this is clearly what has to happen now so we have to to think in terms of a compact between humanity and nature. And this has to, technically, this has to happen by integrating these externalities. There are no externalities. The very fact that we talk about externalities is actually a mistake, but it's a normal mistake within our current vision because there is no outside. The, 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 it have, the ecology is actually a condition of our life. It's not not anything external to the economy. Um, so everything that I try to explain until now is about achieving this, is about achieving technically a technical infrastructure, which would allow us to uh, to do this, right? To, to as, as we go through this chaotic transition today, come out on the other side with new social contracts, new compacts, and new technologies that allow us to do this. Okay, maybe one word now about cosmolocal production. I hope you're still following me. Uh, so what does it mean? Uh, it has a triple definition, uh, in at least for the P2P Foundation. So the, the phrase we use is very simple. It's everything that's light is global and shared, and everything that's heavy is as local as we can. And we talk about the subsidiarity of material production. Subsidiarity is a word that comes from uh, uh, actually Catholic thought, but it's used by the European Union as the founding principle of the European Union. And it means at the lowest possible appropriate level. It doesn't mean everything has to be localized. It has to be localized when it makes sense. Um, there's actually, we add a third one, which is, you know, kind of, cooperative organizations. So you'd have a global open design community. You have a network of multi-factories and factories that reproduce locally. And then you have a cooperative form of organization to ensure, you know, these kind of warm currency stuff uh, happens uh, on the ground. Um, now, if you would look at the COVID-19 crisis, you would, you would really see why this is so important because, um, you know, so different things we, we did, for example, is we went to, to such a radical form of just in time that there is absolutely no slack in the system. So there's no resilience at all at the local level. And so when the supply chain uh, was um, interrupted in China, suddenly Europe and the States have no masks. Uh, nothing, uh, no personal equipment, uh, no ventilators. It's it's all in the global supply chain. Um, 
and so bit, so typically it's a crisis of carrying capacity right now in general studies show that we spend three times more uh, on material transportation than on material production so we actually spend three times more matter energy on transport than we do on actually making things um, and so this is where cosmolocal production comes in if we can reduce this you know three to one factor that is going to bring down the our um, um, our footprint down to a really sizable level then if we mutualize and for example if you mutualize cars in a neighborhood you can keep the full amount of mileage uh, but you save between 9 and 13 private cars for every shared car right so the combination of mutualization and cosmo local production so those three principles together uh, can guarantee a very strong uh, diminishment of our human footprint. Um, so this is, I think, really, really important uh, in, in the current transition. So I guess I'm finished with the broad story, but maybe also say why this is politically important. So we now have neoliberal globalization, the full movement of people and things, and we have a populist uh, reaction which says, no, let's go back to the nation state. Let's protect the nation state. Um, so I think this is also kind of politically a third option where we say, OK, we want to keep at the highest possible level um, global coordination and global cooperation in culture, in science and technology. At the same time, we want to go back to a sensible relocalization. In, you know, in terms of uh, footprints and ecological balance, right? So this is what cosmolocal production offers as uh, a promise. Um, and so if you look at COVID-19, again, you look at some of the reaction, we see a massive mobilization of open source communities and they try to look for local factories to do this. And this works. Uh, in Belgium, we have Brussels, a friend of mine who was also in the board of the P2P succeeded in one week to have one million masks produced, uh, you know, combining. Uh, so we have, you know, 30 ventilator projects and, and everything. So this is really, I think COVID-19 is interesting because it's about a great rev a revealer of the contradictions of the system and a great accelerator. Accelerate. It's a pedagogical catastrophe, but it also shows us what's not working yet. And so basically, I would argue the two things that are not working is, first of all, the commons themselves have very weak institutions. We are very good at rapidly mobilizing. We're not so good at organizing permanently and, and accumulating our own capital, as it were, right? So that's one issue. The second issue is that all the interfaces with the market and the state are not working. So for example, in the UK, Boris Johnson faced with the, you know, the, the lack of uh, ventilators, goes to talk to the companies, the manufacturing companies. It totally ignores that there's at least 50 groups in the UK already working on ventilators that can be, you know, rapidly produced uh, and these, big manufacturer actually slower than than the open source uh, methodology can can offer so that's a, an interface problem, right and so here i talk about public commons protocols and public commons cooperation and and, and this can can be done because it has been done in uh, in italy we have uh, the bologna regulation for the care and regeneration of the urban commons where one million Italians are now able to do urban commoning with the, with the legitimacy and agreement uh, of the cities in Italy. Um, and so basically then I saw recently in Slovenia, a model that, that I really think is uh, interesting, it's called 4P. And so it's public, private, public. 
uh, public, private, uh, and citizen, or whatever. I, I forget what they, they call it. But anyway, this is one of the first formal models I see where you know the the public sphere, the market sphere, and the civic sphere, and its commons and, and pre-production cap capability is kind of institutionally um, cooperating in a coherent way. Um, so this is, I, I think, also part of the agenda, at least for me, is that there is a political and institutional adaptation that needs to happen so that the advantages of the commons can be used much more rapidly and smoothly than they are today. Okay, here I'm concluding um, with the problem of value. So here is what we have. We have an extractive value system that creates value by exploiting people and resources. And that creates a sovereign currency. Um, and this is just part of life. We cannot we cannot survive as humanity without having at least part of it, you know, that is based on extracting natural resources. At the same time, we don't have we have a system based on contributions, a contributory economy, where urban commoners and open source people are creating an enormous amount of generative activity, which we also need, right? I don't know if you're familiar with Bernard Lietta, who was a Belgian uh, economist and the author of the book, The Mystery of Money, where he says that until the 17th century or the 15th century, we had dual currencies. So civilizations had both a cold and warm currency. Um, and we lost that. And this is something that is absolutely necessary to recreate so that we can, so the, the idea I'm trying to explain here, maybe not as well as I should, is the idea that as long as the generative activity is dependent on extractive financing, we are going to be marginal, right? Because you need taxes or philanthropy to fund absolutely crucial regenerative activities. Um, and so a lot of my thinking recently is 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 in the the question i don't have a good answer yet but the question is can we also in some way capitalize on the commons right because that's what capitalism is is you have projected earnings and you discounted it and that's how you decide how to invest that's how capital accumulation work can we also imagine forms of commons accumulation where you know the future value of the commons uh, of the, the, the effects of, of generative work can also somehow be accounted for and be an incentive for all the people who do generative work, right? So that would imply the idea of having warm currencies that can also be um, given exchange uh, as a direct way to, to stimulate generative activity. And so let me give you an example of this. So there is a, a common uh, a land trust movement in um, in France called Terre des Liens, and already in 2016, they calculated that the work of their organic farmers, because they buy land out of the market and then they lease it with an ecological agreement to organic farmers, was saving the French state 300 million euros per year in depollution costs. Right. So this is, for me, a very powerful way of thinking about this. Can we create systems of circular finance? And that's also where shared distributed ledgers would come in. So you'd have a system where you would say, OK, we, we want to decarbon the priority of our societies. Let everybody, every citizen do this and have his impact is decarbonization impact verified and tokenized. And then you look for these kinds of circular fundings. So this would create a, a system of value in our society where these generative activities would not be only dependent on redistribution of extractive value, but would also kind of generate their own uh, value systems, which would work uh, on, a, on a smooth basis. All right, I just want to give this example. 
Um, and also to show you that distributed ledgers are not just private things that you do to create economic networks, that we can use them in society as a public function, right? So shared distributed public ledgers that would function in society as an alternative, for example, to competitive procurement. All right. Thanks a lot. That was very interesting, and I agree with a lot of points of you there. Thank you. Um, I think we can open this up for discussion now as planned. I know there's 13 people in this room right now. Uh, is anybody here who would like to ask a question or um, make a comment? Not yet. All right, um, <clears throat> fellow spacer raised his hand. Please unmute yourself. Hey. Hello. Hey, uh, thank you for this. Okay, uh, I'm an architect, yeah. So I'm working on uh, uh, making a new system for architects, a new set of tools. Yes. So for these tools, uh, I'm trying to use uh, natural uh, resources and transform them into natural capital. Because uh, as you said, using uh, natural capital accounting, we can have a view. So the issue is to uh, create a, an evolutionary uh, design system using uh, natural capital accounting. Which means that basically right now we have the commodity markets which gives a, a value to a tree, but we, we can enhance that value by putting on the byproducts of the tree, which is the CO2 absorption and uh, uh, risk management and whatever. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Yes. So, so if we create markets, if we increase the value of uh, nature, then uh, we can allow social, uh, uh, can allow local communities to create their own uh, uh, projects in collaboration with architects, and this will uh, define new uh, territories. So what is expected uh, to arrive at is uh, to have uh, clusters of uh, nature, uh, which is uh, without human activity, and then have the communities uh, at the edges of the environmental systems, which manage the commons, and then we have the high ultra high density cities. So if we create this uh, accounting system for uh, natural uh, resources, digitizing using a blockchain uh, ledger or system of blockchains, mm -hmm. that means that uh, these communities can uh, issue themselves uh, currency. So it's like um, and this currency actually belongs to them because it's uh, their uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, assets. Yeah, so this will uh, give architecture, uh, create a new unified uh, design field. So this is the thing I'm working on. Yes. I, I'm very interested. So if you could send me some more information about your project. Okay. Um, I, I, I think so, you know, in the way it, it, it fits with my presentation is that you're clearly also looking for the same kind of, of solutions, right? You're trying to mix markets and community and environment and bring things that were external to the system inside the system so i i think the the question for me and you know within the the green movement you would have people who totally reject uh you know any marketization of um and i'm i'm in between so i would say what we have to avoid is a purely speculative you know, um, translation of, of, of this, right? So where, for example, the, the carbon trading doesn't work. And we, we gave money to the people who actually polluted the most and, and there's no result. So we have to be very careful that we use, you know, generative market techniques and not extractive market techniques that, that we design the system that we have. And I, I think that's what you're looking for, right? We design the incentives. I mean, instead of uh, yes. we are moving away from explicit design.
to the design of incentives and to create yes. an evolutionary design system. Yes. Well, I, I'm very interested in learning more about your, your project. Seems very forward looking. Okay. If you can post some uh, uh, contact details, I, I will do it. Yes. I don't know where to do that, but Grief, Grief if he is there, he has my email. Okay. Uh, otherwise, it's Michelle at p2pfoundation.net. Thanks a so lot. Thank you for it. I saw that Cem wanted to ask a question. Hello. Hello. Hi, Michelle. Big fan of yours Hi. and your work. You. Um, yeah, I unfortunately could have joined uh, only in the later stages of your presentation, but uh, I heard the emphasis on carbon markets and uh, sort of uh, how broken the current system is. Um, we will be presenting uh, after your talk uh, and it's about CO2 can basically our uh, sort of design intervention in this area. So I just would like to uh, extend the invitation or hope that you will be there so you can tell us uh, if, if this is uh, this rises up to your uh, I can stay of, about 20 uh, minutes after, of... yes, after seven. Yes, thank you. Yes. So, and please, great, send me, you please send me some, uh, some information. And I, I would hope Good. that the people behind Noncom, you know, that we that we get some kind of documentation of all the different projects that go into that direction. I would be very interested in in compiling that and, and you know making it also diffuse these these kind of projects. I think that shouldn't be very much doable by us. <laughs> so. If I've not seen any other questions, but one thing that I want to ask is um, you talked a lot about the value of accounting and what it represents to us and um, the change from one form of accounting to another. And one thing that I have a bit of trouble with is that in accounting, we try to be as precise as possible because especially in double, uh, yes. double entry accounting, we need to have them line up. So there's not much room for differences in, yeah. um, in valuing different things. And as soon as we move out of a, uh, an internal accounting for a corporation or for a state, then there are differences in accounting and differences in valuing different things. And especially yeah. when we move to a shared accounting, there is a disconnect between what has been outside the system and how we value that yes. and how we bring that in. And do you have any thoughts on, on that disconnect? Um, and... Well, so, uh, I think one of the things that you know we did as a society uh, as of the 18th century is to calculate everything, um, and to the point where we have today a system where if if we can't count it, it doesn't exist. And it's one of the big issues is that we ignore quality entirely. So there is no more room in our society for quality, and we actually often we act actively destroy quality because we want quantity. I mean, if you start measuring the work of a nurse, uh, you know, if you in the hospital, you like, uh, you know, that she's friendly, that she has time for you, that she listens to you. Uh, as Once you start measuring every action, you know, actually accounting for every action in time, they can't do that anymore, right? So you you actually have destroyed quality by measuring that quantity because they, the psychology completely changes. And, and we, we are doing this with everything, education, and we're screwing up, I think we're screwing up a lot of our systems. So, so the question for me becomes is, how can we also integrate quality and, and the evaluation of quality, right? And okay, I don't know if this is a solution, but I actually like what they're doing. This is called the economy of the common good by Christian Felber. And so, so he started by looking at all the constitutions in Europe and said every constitution in Europe says that the economy should serve the common good. Most people believe the common good is something metaphysical. He says, no, this is something we can discuss. So we can bring people together and come to an agreement about, you know, what, what is the common good in our context. And so they arrive at these 17 clusters of impact that they then evaluate and they already have 2000 organizations doing that right so this is a different from internal account this is like accounting 
from the outside in, right? So whereby the idea is that every corporation, every cooperative, every group of people could actually judge themselves based on this quality criteria as well. The the problem the problem is of course one of you know standardization to some extent, right? Is the capacity to to come to an agreement that certain qualities are shared and so that we can then start comparing them. So that's that's difficult to do. That's also difficulty with these warm currencies. So if you design a warm currency inside one community and it makes sense for that warm community that one community, how do you then deal with other communities? Do you know what I mean? And I, I don't I don't know how that works. I I, I find that very difficult issue. Absolutely. Um, but the way you discussed it, I think there's two options right now. Either we find a standardized way of valuing stuff and and agreeing on a on on a form of valuing, or we have different value systems that value internally but have a sort of exchange rate of values with other communities. Yes. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there there have been uh, so there is uh, Adam Arvidsson in in um, um, he's a Italian Swedish professor is now in Naples. He wrote a book called The Ethical Economy, and he was trying to set up this idea of you know com comparing values, where each group would define its own value, but the, there would be kind of a global meta system that that would also work at the same time. I I forgot the details. But to some people trying to work on this, um, I don't know if it's going to work, but I think, you know, we're a time of experimentation. So this is the time to, to do this, right? <laughs> That's what we're here for. Cem, I see you. And Griff, I think, yeah. was before you raising the hand. Uh, yeah, just the, well, I asked the question in the chat and actually left Terrace asked the question in the chat. And he already kind of just dove into it. And it's, uh, but on this quantification of a qualitative value that was held before, a lot of these commons-esque organizations really are built around creating this, this quality, qualitative value. And when it starts getting quantifi quanti uh, quantified, it, it kind of makes things weird, right? Like money just comes in and things get weird. And I'm just curious if, You've seen any organizations that have been able to transition to a, an accounting system successfully that we should look towards because it's it's a dicey situation you know you start measuring everybody's com contributions right well i mean i i don't know the status of this project uh, I don't know how well it is working, but you know the one that is the most sophisticated has always been that from Sensorica. Sensorica, um, and I, I think it works for them, but they still have a lot of difficulty getting. So the the problem for them is the interface with the state, right? When there is the research money, there's still no no willingness from state actors to to link their subsidies, let's say, or research funding to this kind of open system. So that's that's the big issue for them. They haven't, you know, succeeded in, in, in convincing um, any public authorities to, to say, okay, we'll give them money and then we allow the open system to decide how it will be distributed, right? This is not happening. So this is a uh, which which means then that they're working at the margins, you know. They 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 stay small. Yeah. Now there there are some maybe an example I can give you, which I thought was interesting. This is called Ethos Foundation, and it's actually some kind of consulting organization in the UK, and um, they have big contracts like with the British Army around sports, and you know it's a few million pounds. And so what they do is the following. So they have shares, market shares, which they give to all the people who are involved in client work. So these are people actually fulfilling their contracts with their clients. But then they also know that 
a lot of people in their network are creating value for the network, which increases their capital, their attractivity, their marketing power, and which actually generates leads. And so what they do is they, every five years, they split the commercial shares in two, and they give the other half to these contributive shares, right? So there's kind of an indirect valuation uh, that is happening of the generative work. Um, another thing which was used by, by my friends in, in guerrilla translation is to reserve X percent of the income, commercial income, to a second contributive accounting system, right? So you, you accumulate, you know, karma or whatever it's called, and then periodically the karma is funded by these by a portion of the market value um, the 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 issue that i recognize in what you say is you know it's called crowding out right it's the one the, is that once you start a competitive game it can actually instead of promoting it can also undermine the cooperative spirit and i i think that's you know a matter of experimentation and design to to see because the, the problem is if you don't do it then of course you condemn commoning to be a permanently volunteer and margin activity and i i'm more in agreement with people like you i think who said no this is this is how we want to work and this is how you know we want to make a living and therefore we need some connection with the market in order to be funded. Uh, I just want to also inject Left Harris's question because he asked it halfway through. Uh, he tried to Google uh, for flow accounting and for thermodynamic accounting to understand it a bit better, but he couldn't really find any good links. Do you have any? Um, so so I, I have to make my own <laughs> a promotion here. So it's called P2P accounting for planetary survival. And it's a, it's a synthesis of those three forms of accounting. And, you know, it brought a, it brought a lot of projects together. And, and I, I so the, these are concepts that are not generally used yet, you know, in the outside world. So this, this comes specifically from smaller communities that are experimenting. And that's kind of vocabulary that's used. Um, but uh, yeah, if you if you look at that report, you'll find the different projects that do that. Oh, perfect. Um,